Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Start. So, welcome to the third in this series. So, you know, all the little guns you saw in the first two lectures are all going to be firing today. <laughs> Please, James. Thanks. Uh, okay, so, uh, right, so the, our goal today is actually to prove the main theorem, and I'll remind you what it is. Um, uh, and uh, of all the, well, I, I think this will be pretty interesting. It's a, it's, a, it's a cute proof, and finally I figured out a way that, uh, how to explain it in a talk. So, uh, first, first let me remind you, uh, okay, just the object we're working with again, and I'll try to write, tell me if I'm not writing big enough. I see that many people are sitting uh, quite a distance away. All right. Uh, the objects we're talking about, again, uh, a collection of jointly Gaussian random variables, a Gaussian process. Uh, we equip this with the canonical metric, which is the, the L2 metric here. And our goal was to understand the quantity which is the expected supremum of this process. And, uh, and remember, the philosophy is to understand this quantity in terms of the, in terms of the geometry. Okay, so the index set here is capital T. The philosophy is to understand this in terms of the geometry of this sort of of this metric space T. Okay. Um, so now let me remind you very briefly uh, the what the upper bound was because we're going to prove a matching lower bound today. So um, uh, we'll take a sequence of a uh, sequence of partitions of t, and we'll call this sequence. So this is a sequence of partitions. Uh, it's a sequence of increasing partitions. So, so here, a n plus one is a refinement of a n, and uh, and we'll call this sequence. So this sequence of partitions is, let's call it admissible, uh, if it satisfies two properties. The first property is just that, well, we start with the, the whole set. So we start with a trivial partition uh, into one piece. And the second property, and what we saw this last time, is that uh, we have some upper bound on the sizes of these partitions. Okay, so the first partition is into one piece, and the nth partition should be into at most two to the two of the n pieces. Okay, and we saw and we saw before. I mean, in the in the first talk, why this this number comes up naturally. Basically, well, uh, uh, the number of if if you eventually we're going to be considering the sort of the log of the number of points is going to be the important thing, and if you want the log to double, then you should be squaring the number of points, which is why you have a, a growth pattern like this. And the important upper bound we proved was, was due to Fernique and sort of an earlier version, the entropy bound due to Dudley, which says that we can bound, given any such admissible sequence of partitions, we can bound the expected supremum of the process in this way. So I'll remind you what this notation means in a second. But given any admissible, okay, so this holds for every admissible sequence. And uh, and just to remind you of this notation, let me write it here in red. Uh, for one of these partitions, so if if t if little t is the point of big T, then for some partition a n, a n of t is just the the set of a n containing Little t. All right, fine. Did they do this in like, no? All right. Okay. Okay. So the this that's so I hope this is so this this is just the diameter of the set in this partition containing t, and we prove this is the ch chaining upper bound. Okay, and uh, so what you can do is, is you can define let's define a functional which is, which is called gamma two, of this metric space. 
which is just the best possible upper bound that this Fernik chaining argument proves. So the functional is just take the infimum over all admissible sequences of the upper bound you get. I'm just writing the same thing over again. OK. So, uh, so what, what we, the, the Fernique's bound exactly says that the expected supremum is upper bounded by the gamma 2 functional. right? Uh, the gamma 2 functional gives you the best possible upper bound. And now we can state what's called the majorizing measures theorem, which is what we're going to prove today, that, in fact, uh, such a sequence of partitions is the only way to upper bound the expected supremum. So in fact, the expected supremum of any Gaussian process is proportional to this gamma 2 functional. Okay, So here, proportional just means up to an absolute constant. It's at most c times gamma 2, and it's at least gamma 2 over c for some constant c. Okay, And this is due to, this was conjectured by, uh, uh, by Fernick, and then eventually proved by Talegram that, that this gamma 2 functional controls the expected supremum. And this turns out to be a fairly powerful thing. Um, I claim today that, uh, that this will be, be the only proof of the majorizing measures theorem given that was possible to understand in a talk. That's my claim. It's a bold claim. But, <laughs> uh, but the, the presentation of the proof of this theorem is always kind of disgusting. Uh, and OK, so I think there's, there's a nice way to do it. But this is our goal today. We've, we've already proved the upper bound. The goal is to prove the lower bound. And now I just want to remind you uh, what we were talking about last time. We, we introduced some tools to prove the lower bound. So the first tool uh, was the Sudokov inequality, which said the following. OK, again, there's this, this, this I'm not going to keep writing down this process. We have this Gaussian process sitting in the background all the time, this Gaussian process x sub t. says that if we, if we take a bunch of points t1, t2 up to tm, uh, such that the pairwise distances in our metric are all are, are large, so they're all at least alpha for i not equal to j. Then, and we proved this last time using Slepian's lemma, this comparison inequality. Then, if we look at the expected supremum of say x t one up to x t m, we said that this is at least grows like alpha times the square root log the number of points here. This is what we proved last time. Somehow, it was, somehow there was a, a lower bound that matches what the what the union bound gives. Uh, if we if we knew all the points were distance alpha, the sort of the the Gaussian tail inequality would say the expected theorem is at most alpha square root log m. So if we know they're at least alpha, we get some kind of matching lower bound. And from this, we actually want to get uh, a slightly stronger corollary. So let me make a, okay, let me make it down here. Let me make one definition. That's going to be useful. Definition uh, for some subset A of our process, let's define G of A to be the just the expected supremum of the subprocess when we look at the variables in A. Okay, so our expected supremum is just is just G of t, but in general, for some sub sort of some subset A, we can consider G of A. Okay, now here's a, here's a corollary. Uh, I mean, it's a corollary that will require a proof of this Sudokov inequality. Um, so, so again, uh, let's, let's say, OK, so now we have, uh, let's write it this way. So under the same assumptions, so again, we have, think about we have m points, all pairwise instances are large. I want to get, get a slightly better lower bound than this, uh, which is of the following form. Um, I claim that the expected supremum, if we consider uh, OK, so this is for some r. r is going to be a fixed constant. Uh, so you can think about if you want r equals, uh, r equals 20 definitely works for everything in the talk. Okay, a Little r is always going to be some fixed constant. Uh, so the, the claim is that if we look at the expected supremum of not just not just looking at the points t1 to the tn, but let's look at small balls around the points. I'll draw a picture in a second. Then we can actually get something slightly better. So uh, what we can get is we get this alpha over square log m 
Here, C is some universal constant. Whenever I write C, it's a universal constant. So this hits some universal constant. This C is a universal constant. I claim we can get this plus uh, something a little bit more. So, I so we, get, we get a contribution coming from the centers of these balls. I claim that we can also get the minimum contribution coming from, um, coming from one of the balls. Okay, so the picture is so the picture is that we've got we've got our whole space T. You give me these separated points T1, T2, T3, T4, like this. And now they're separated by, by alpha. But now I, I come and I, I look at even a much smaller ball around each point, an alpha over R ball around each point. And the claim that we're we're making here is that not only do we get this large contribution coming from one of the variables you know, x sub t1, we can also get some contribution from what's going on inside these balls. Okay? And let me, just, let me just sort of sketch the proof of that. So what we saw before is that, I mean, we can always, we can always make a move like this. So let's, let's just fix some point t0. Okay? I don't care what t0 is. We can always make a move like this where we say the expected supremum, just because all these variables are centered, okay, I mean, this is, the expected value of this is zero, so we can, we can do this just fine. And so the idea is that what this, what this pseudo-cov inequality says is that, is that sort of, well, we know that is that, that, is that um, uh, one of these, I'm, I'm looking at these sort of, these, these values here are like xt1 minus xt0. We know that one of these should be large. The expected supremum of one of these things will be large, okay? And what we'd like to do is say, well, also, I should be able to get some credit for you know, the supremum. Now think about, the, think about each ti as being the center of its ball. And then I should be able to get some credit for these little black arrows as well. So I should not just get one of these. I should get one of these plus one of these. Okay? And the reason we take the minimum here is because we don't know which one of these we're going to get. right? I, I don't know a priori which one of these variables is going to be big. I just know that one of them should be big. So I get one of them to be big, and then uh, and then I want to get sort of this associated black arrow as well. Okay. Now, of course, the problem is that if I condition, for instance, on this one being big, I could screw up the expectation of this ball. Right? So, uh, so first of all, let me just assume, let me say, assume for the moment that, that essentially all the time, all of these balls have the fact that, they're, uh, that the value here, so this, the supremum here, okay, again, what is the supremum here? It's the, we look at xt minus x t4 over all over all t's you know all t's in this ball I'll write it as alpha r look at look at all these things I claim that this, we can basically think that this is a premium here is always at least the expectation so the expectation is b ti alpha over r minus okay something that looks like some constant c times alpha over r times square root log of m okay so let's assume that I can I say all the time no matter what happens that all these balls achieve at least a value, which is their expectation minus this. Okay? Then we're done in the following way. Uh, because what we'll, what we'll get here is instead of this inequality, we'll get this minus c alpha over r square root log m. But then by choosing r to be a large enough constant, this can be absorbed into here. In fact, by choosing here r equals what? Twice c squared. Well, you know, by choosing r to be this, which is just some constant, this gets absorbed into here, and you would get a 2 here. Okay? So if we could guarantee that all these, ball, these small balls always achieve at least their expectation minus a little bit of loss, we get this inequality. And this is... Is alpha times square root log n? Yeah, it could be, could be, much, could be much larger. Because it could be many, many more points in there, right? So the diameter went down, but if the number of points went up by a huge amount, then it could be larger. Yeah. And uh, okay, so so if we if we knew this, now I claim that this is this is essentially true. And the reason this is essentially true, we wrote down last time, is because um, uh, is because of the following concentration inequality, which I I uh, I want to fo focus on the proof of the main theorem. So I won't prove the concentration inequality now. But if someone wants to see it at the end, uh, the proof is not not too difficult just from the classical concentration inequality for on on the Gaussian measure in Rn. So here's the, here's the concentration inequality, though. If we have a Gaussian process 
xt, then the claim is that the probability that the supremum of xt differs from its expectation by more than lambda, all right, it grows like this. It's exponential in, OK, maybe factor 2 here, minus lambda squared over something. And here's the important point. This something just depends on the, on the maximum variance, so the maximum xt squared value. Okay? So this is, a, this is a classical concentration inequality, which is somewhat surprising, because it doesn't depend on the number of points in this process. In fact, this t could be an infinite set, could be some kind of continuous set. And still, the only thing that matters is the maximum variance. OK, um, uh, okay so it's a, well, we can get to the proof later. But why does this finish it? Because what's the, if we look at any, any variable of the form xt here in this ball, any variable of this form, well, we know the ball has radius alpha over r in this metric, which means that the variance of this, the variance of all of these random variables is at most, the variance of this thing, is at most alpha over r squared. I mean, the Euclidean distance is at most alpha over r, which means that the variance is at most alpha over r squared. So, so now, I mean, you plug alpha over r squared in here. If we want, if we want, if we want sort of we want to take a union bound. We have, we have m events, these m balls. We want to take a union bound. We, we should try to get this morally to be about 1 over m, right? which means we should take lambda to be about uh, what c times square root log m times the maximum variance. But the maximum variance is alpha over r. Oh, sorry, times, sorry, not the variance, because we're squaring lambda, times the maximum distance, which is alpha over r. So the point is that. Uh, if we take lambda to be this, then we can basically be assured that none of the balls will deviate by more than this. And that's exactly what we said we were getting in the first place. Okay? So if you just make that slightly more rigorous, then you get the actual statement of the dilemma. But basically, these balls, the fluctuation in these balls can be absorbed into, the main, into this term. All right. So that proves our concentration inequality. And I mean, that proves, uh, that proves uh, our corollary. And now, actually, you can forget everything about Gaussian processes, because now that we have this, this is the only thing, this is what we're going to use about Gaussian processes. So in fact, um, let's, let's, uh, now let me state this theorem. Let me restate it slightly differently. And then we'll just be able to focus on the proof of this theorem. OK, so, uh, so let f be any functional, so just a, a real valued function on subsets of t. Okay? Think about f as measuring the size of the subset. The, the f we're going to use is actually just this, the expected supremum. But it's somehow, we don't want to, we can now divorce ourselves from, this, from, from thinking about random variables, because we're just going to use this fact. Okay? Such that two properties hold. One property is that this is a measure of size. So uh, if a is a subset of b, then f of a should be at most f of b. Okay? This is certainly satisfied for, our, for the expected supremum. Uh, and the second property is just that this holds. Okay? So let, but let me just restate it here, and then I won't erase this for the rest of the talk. The second property is that um, uh, if we have t1, t2, up to tm in our set, and the distances between these things are pairwise at least some alpha, for all i not equal to j, then this holds. So then the functional applied to the union of the balls is at least some constant times alpha square root log m plus the minimum over the balls. Oh, sorry, of the functional applied to the balls. Okay. So we're going, to say, we're going to take any functional that satisfies these properties. Certainly, the ex, this little g functional, which is just the expected supremum, satisfies these properties. And then, OK, so then I claim there exists an admissible sequence uh, of partitions, a sub n, such that we get exactly one. If we apply the functional to t, then up to some constant factor, this is at least this. Okay. 
So the, the point is, for, for any functional on subsets satisfying this kind of growth inequality, uh, I claim that there exists an admissible sequence such that this lower bounds f of t. Yeah? So why does g satisfy the property number one? So let's say I take, like, let's say a is a uh, part of the space where things are getting really crazy, and then b is, is that, is oh. a plus, like, basically, like, a flat area? Won't the expected supremum in B be smaller? The expected supremum of a, of a subset is always less than the expected supremum of the whole set. I mean, oh, it's a subset. Even, even, more, even more stronger than that, the supremum of a subset is always less than the supremum of the whole set for any, right? Yeah, this, this, is, this holds trivially for, 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 uh, for the expected supremum. Uh, but the, I hope does everybody see that this, this, will, this finishes the proof. Because now if we just instantiate F with the expected supremum, then we show that there exists an admissible sequence. And of course, now, by definition, this is, I mean, I'll just, this is at least gamma 2. So that finishes the proof. So now our entire goal is to show that if you give me f, I can give you this sequence of partitions, so that f of t is at least this. And a lot of the power uh, from this framework comes in the fact that sort of this is a very general kind of thing that applies to lots of different kinds of processes, or, or modifications of this condition apply to lots of different kinds of processes. All right, so this is our goal. And in fact, so just remember, an admissible sequence has the nth thing has size at most 2 to the n. That's all you need to remember from any of this. And now let's erase this and just concentrate on. So I hope everybody understands. This, everything we're doing now has nothing to do with probability anymore. Uh, it, it's just about something about metric spaces. And still. Pretty. So specifying this uh, partition is actually also going to be not very difficult at all. Uh, I'm going to use. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's see what's going to happen. I will specify the partition here, and then I'll do the analysis here. OK. OK, so uh, what's that? I thought that was already the partition. <laughs> it's not quite that simple. Yeah. It's the most two to the two pieces. All right. Uh, OK, so, so let's start the partition. That's awesome. All right, that's a good first step. Uh, there's one thing that's going to happen, is that every set in the partition is also going to have a value. Okay. Which is gonna which is gonna upper bound the diameter of the set. Okay, so the value for this piece will just be, uh, I mean, and the value the value will be implicit because it's not. I don't need some notation for it, but uh, the value of this piece is just the diameter of the set. Okay. Um, okay. So now, so now, well, let's suppose that you've come and you've given me a sub n looks some way. You've partitioned the space in a sub n. Let's just choose. I'm going to get the next partition by taking every, every piece C in your a sub n. OK, let's blow up C just for the sake of, OK, here's C. Now I'm going to partition C into 2 to the 2 to the n pieces. Okay. So I'll take each of these pieces and partition them further into 2 to the 2 to the n pieces. And of course, if I do that, then the size of n plus 1 is at most 2 to the 2 to the n times 2 to the 2 to the n, which is 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1. So this will give an admissible sequence. So how am I going to partition it? This is the whole, all right. Uh, let me tell you how to choose the first piece, and then I'll tell you how to choose all the pieces. So, uh, so we choose, OK. And this set C has some value delta, OK? Remember, this value delta is just an upper bound of the diameter of C. Okay. Uh, actually, it's an, it's an upper bound on the radius of C, not the diameter. In other, words, in other words, C is contained in some ball of radius delta. But this is not a, you can multiply by two if that makes you uncomfortable. Uh, OK, so now choose t1 in C uh, such that the following quantity is maximized. Take your functional, look at the ball around t1 of radius delta over r squared. Okay? r is some constant which is bigger than 20, and such that this is satisfied. Just think about r as a constant. I mean, it's a, it is a constant. OK. Uh, such that this intersected with C um, is maximized, is maximal. 
Okay. In other words, cut out the biggest piece you can where big is defined by looking at this small ball around the thing. Okay. Okay. Except, well, I said choose t1 such this happens. Here's the whole trick of the proof. Uh, and set c1, which is the first piece of our partition, to be, and this is the, this is where all the magic happens. I mean, you won't see the magic now, uh, but see it soon. And set c1 to be the, the delta over r bar on t1. So what we do is the following: we first choose some point t1, which maximizes this amount. Okay. Think. Okay. So what am I looking at to maximize this amount? I'm looking at this delta over r squared ball around t1. But then once I've chosen t1, I actually cut out the delta over r ball. So I actually cut out this bigger ball. I write this delta over r. Okay. That's how I choose t1. Right? So this is a delta over r squared ball. This is cutting out the delta over r ball. Right? And uh, the value of this set will be delta over r, which is, of course, an upper bound in its <coughs> radius because it was cut out. All right. Uh, OK, so now, now we just keep going. So uh, in general, let's let d sub l be the amount of space that's remaining after we've gone l steps. So it will be, it will be c minus everything we've cut out so far. OK? And we'll choose t sub l, the next point in d sub l, um, uh, to, to again maximize the same sort of quantity. It maximizes the delta over r square ball intersected with what's left. And finally, we put c sub l equals, uh, and again, we, we, we maximize according to the delta over r square ball, but we cut out the delta over r ball. C plus yeah, OK, good call. Yes, CL plus 1. And uh, probably TL plus 1. If we, uh, this is 1, this is 1. All right. OK. OK. So again, OK, so, th so let the, the procedure says, OK, now we go to, we select the next point T2 such that this, this ball is large. Cut this out. Maybe the next point T3 looks like this. But this is, happens to be pretty large. We cut this out. And we keep going. But now we, want, we only want to cut out 2 to the 2 to the n pieces. Okay? So uh, and we, might, we might get screwed up, and we might, I mean, we might not exhaust the space before we get to 2 to the 2 to the n pieces. So except, so let's, uh, OK, so I should have specified here. Let's let, uh, uh, let's let m here. I just want to, I don't want to write 2 to the 2 to the n over and over again. So let's let m be 2 to the 2 to the n. Okay? So this is m is the number of pieces. So we keep going, except that dot, 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 dot. Except that C sub m, OK, I'm not going to write down here, dot, 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 except that C sub m is actually just going to be D sub m. So in other words, when you get to the end, you've got nothing left to do. So we're cutting, we're cutting, we're cutting. We, went, we finally got to the, the, the mth point. Again, it was chosen to maximize this ball. But now, well, what can we do? We just cut out the whole set. So this is T sub m. I mean, this is, this is C sub m. This is the last set, OK? Good. I thought I got rid of all plus one, though. OK, good. All right. OK. All right, that's the whole, OK, and I, that's, that's it. We're done. Except I have to tell you, OK, obviously we can't reduce the, the value here is now delta. We didn't reduce the diameter, so the value estimate here is delta. All these pieces now have value delta of r, and this piece has value delta. And that specifies the entire partitioning. Because I told you how to break up one piece, now you just could just keep going on and on and on. OK? Uh, the claim is that this partition satisfies this lower bound. All right. So now, when, now we need to get to the, all right, that's the whole partitioning. It's really quite simple. Uh, it's not clear right now, but it was actually chosen, the partitioning is chosen so as to make this tree as balanced as possible. Okay, you might not think it's balanced because they say, well, why would you, if you look, you're cutting out the biggest pieces, so you might leave behind very little. But, well, you'll see what comes up. Actually, this is going to tend to be the biggest piece. 
Okay, that's not even true, but let's, let's see what happens. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to the analysis of this partition. So, so uh, Talagrand's analysis involves defining five quantities. I'm not gonna do this, I'm just telling you. It involves finding five quantities that satisfy seven equations, and then verifying that with every possible choice, all these things are, are, are remain satisfied, and then summing something at the end, which is, it's hard to understand. Okay, this proof is gonna be understandable, hopefully. Okay, so, so let's, here's the, here's the idea. Uh, we can think about, of course, this whole partition as a tree. So it looks like it's a tree. And when I draw this tree, I just want to use, I'm gonna use one convention that the, the leaves of the tree are, I mean, the children go from left to right. So if, if we indeed cut out M pieces at this level, the last piece, this giant, this giant sucker over here, is, the, is gonna be the rightmost piece, okay? So, okay, so that gives us a tree, and on the nodes of the tree we have, uh, I mean, we have like values, so, you know, we have values like delta, delta over R, and so on, okay? Corresponding to what's going on here. All right. Um, and what the, the final thing we can do is, there, there's a natural value to associate to every edge in the tree, the value of this edge is delta times two to the n over two, okay? So if, if, if this is level n, which means, means we're using two to the two to the n points, the value of this edge is gonna be delta times two to the n over two. If we do that, okay, then here's what I claim. Uh, then I claim that this, this quantity we care about, diameter, a sub n of t, all right? I claim that this is at most, um, uh, okay, I know this is a factor of two, but it doesn't matter. And I hope nobody gets really upset about this. So first of all, it should be, uh, I didn't say it, but uh, uh, let's assume that here, again, it doesn't really matter, but just for simplicity, let's assume that t is finite. The main thing that we're trying to prove follows from the finite case, just by, an easy, well, at least for separable processes, but, uh, okay. But this let's assume that t is finite. So eventually the leaves of this tree are just singletons. We eventually just get uh, singletons at the end and we stop. Uh, so the claim is that, uh, okay, I hope this is clear what it means. We, we've given every edge in this tree a value. And we, so we can, look at a, we can look at a root leaf path in this tree and it has some value, which is the sum of the edge lengths along the path. This, the sum of the edge lengths along the path is essentially this value. Essentially two to the n over two times the diameter, uh, except for the fact that we said this is not actually diameter, this is just an upper bound. So, it's a, it's an, so this upper bound is this value, okay? So, what we're gonna, so now, here's the, here's the whole game. Uh, our, oh, I, Asaf told me not to use red, although the red got better. Uh, well, it's this 2 to the n over 2, but 2 to the n over 2 is square root log the number of points. And square root log, as you see, is an important thing for us, right? So that 2 to the n over 2 is square root log, okay? I'm just, I'm just really reformulating this bound in terms of this tree. Uh, if we think about this tree and we give the edges this length, then the supremum root leaf path is, 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 a, is bigger, is at least this. So our goal now is to show that f of t uh, is at least the value of any root leaf path. In other words, my goal is this. You give me a root leaf path in the tree, I, show, I prove to you that f of t is at least that value. That will prove that it's at least a soup, which proves that it's at least this. Okay, this is the whole game. So now we need two properties. I'll stop using red. We need to, we need to make two observations. Let's keep the, oh no, we have the, we don't need the correlator anymore. We just need to make two observations about this tree. And then, let's see. Oh yeah, we're in good shape. Okay. Observation number one is that only right turns in this tree matter. So if we wanna compute the value, we only have to look at right turns. Okay, so why is that? Let's see. Um, Okay, so right by, and when I say a right turn, I mean a turn like this, which corresponds to having chosen this, having chosen this, there just everything remaining and keeping the parameter value at delta. Okay, so why is it? Well, 
Look what happens anytime you make a turn that's not a right turn. So look, look what happens here. At this level, you got value 2 to the n over 2. I mean, this is up times delta, right? What's the value of this? Well, since it's not a right turn, we know that, OK, so, so since, since uh, let's say, since this was not a right turn, by when I say right turn, I'm referring to, look at the board, the rightmost, the rightmost child. Since this is not a right turn, if this was delta, this goes down to delta over r, which means the value I get here is only 2 to the n over 2 times delta, two, sorry, 2 to the n plus 1 over 2 times delta over r. OK? Now, if you, now suppose I, again, don't make a right turn. So let's suppose this wasn't a right turn. There was another thing here. Well, then the value here is delta over r squared, which means that uh, at the next level, the value is going to be 2 to the n plus 2 over 2 times delta over r squared. Now, r is a number that's bigger than 20. So taking these, taking these non-right turns uh, is a geometrically decreasing sequence as we go. So actually, only basically, if you take a right turn like this, and then uh, a sequence of non-right turns, the value you get along here is just comparable to the value you got here. So we only need to count right turns. No, 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 because, because you, might, you might venture this way in the tree because you know that later on you're going to get to take a lot of very nice right turns. Taking the right, you, might, you might take a right turn and then realize you have nowhere else to go, whereas you might want to like venture, you know, you can, so you can be optimizing all the way down so that you take the most expensive right turns. I mean, OK. So, but the point is that uh, considering the value of root leaf path, I claim we only need to consider the value of right turns. Okay? So in other words, I'm going to just think, of, think about weight 0 being on everything except these edges. That's the first reduction. So let's just well, let's write it down. Only right turns matter. And the second property is that, in fact, if you take a sequence of right turns, only the last one matters. Because, well, let's look what happens in a sequence of right turns. So these are all right turns, which means that the delta parameter stays the same every time. Uh, but now, I mean, what's the value? This is delta times 2 to the n over 2. This is delta times 2 to the n plus 1 over 2. This is delta times 2 to the n plus 2 over 2. It's a geometrically increasing sequence, so that only, you know, OK, let's say, well, this is not a right turn. Only the value of the last right turn matters. So in other, so in other words, when I compute the value of a root leaf path, since I don't, I'm only trying to get things right up to constants, I, I only need to have, uh, I only need to, to add up uh, uh, the, the values for the last right for, for every last right turn in that path. Okay. Again, non right turns uh, are geometrically decreasing, and if I take a sequence of right turns, it's dominated by the last one. Okay. So this. So this, OK, so, uh, and in fact, only the last right turn in the sequence. <coughs> and the sequence of right turns matters. All right. All right, with these two, with these two things set up, uh, all right, with these two things set up, let's, uh, OK, let's just continue here. We're ready to do the analysis, OK? And the analysis is not going to be very difficult. But here's, here, so here, here it is, OK? So, uh, and I apologize for the name of the following thing. If you know of a better name, like if you think of something better that one could actually write in lecture notes, let me know. But, uh, uh, OK, I'm going to call it, so this is the snake poop game. Um, you'll see why. It's really the only appropriate name for this, OK? <laughs> OK. Uh, so again, we want to prove that f of t is at least the value of any root leaf path. And we know that to calculate this value, we only need to look at the values of the, the last right turns along this sequence. OK, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, if you give me this tree, let me define, OK, so this tree had values at ju on just the edges. OK, but I want to put values on the nodes as well. And you'll see why this happens in a second. OK, so the value on a node is just so, so every node, this is a partition tree. Every node corresponds to a set. So the value on a node is just, if this is a set S, is just the functional applied to the set. That's the value at an, for the edges, not for the nodes. We had, the, we had, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, oh, you mean the, these values. These values stick around. The diameter value sticks around. But now let's call it a, 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 a reward. 
No, no, it's just that we have diameter values, I agree, but these are different. So the, they, these things still have diameter values, but let's give them, let's call them rewards, okay? You want to collect these things, all right? I don't know, some kind of other value. Uh, uh, and the edges, instead of giving the edges value delta times 2 to the n over 2, well, look, uh, I'm not going to get delta. I'm only going to get, oh, by the way, we, we, I mean, you could swallow it into the r, but we should put r here just to be clear what's going on. The separation, uh, uh, we didn't have r before. Okay, so we can put c. Never mind. Um, so this, this c will in general be a small number. It could be 1 over 100, right? Uh, instead of having the edges have value 2 to the n over 2 times delta, let me put the edges to have value c times 2 to the n over 2 times delta. Where is this c? Because I, I know I'm not going to be able to get this much if I apply this inequality. I'm only going to be able to get c times this much. So, so the value of an edge here is uh, if, this, if this node sort of had diameter delta, then the value of an outgoing edge is c times 2 to the n over 2 times delta. Okay? Again, if I, if I get a, I mean, if I, get a, if, I, if I can show that f is at least the value of any root leaf path here, again, that value just means along the edges, then I just lost a factor of c. So in other words, changing their edge values didn't affect much, except for the fact that it's going to be a little bit helpful. OK. So now given, given any tree with values like this, uh, you can, like, uh, OK, with, re with rewards, like think about having a subset of the tree. So like choose you know, some vertices and some edges. OK? I, now I can sum up these values. OK? So there's some reward associated with this. Um, my goal now is to show that f of t is at least, uh, so, so you give me some root leaf path. Um, so your root leaf path goes you know, like this. I would like to show that f of t is at least, is at least this value, which is the value of all the right turns in the path. Okay? If we can do that, we're done. What I want to be able to do is write down inequalities on trees, like one tree with some markings is, is, is greater than or equal to some other tree with markings. Okay? So uh, what I want to prove is that f of t is at least this. This is my goal. Okay? Um, I'm not going to be able to prove it. In fact, what I'll prove is that 3 times f of t is at least this. Okay? And this is where the whole, the whole trick is going to come in. So, all right, so that's it. So we're going to prove that 3 times f of t is at least this. You give me your path. This is what I'm going to prove. Okay. So uh, we need to start. So let's, let's start somewhere. Uh, um, all right, so now we're at the top of the tree. Um, and you, you, suppose you tell me the first, uh, the first two steps in your path, OK? So your path goes, um, your path goes like, uh, uh, like this, all right? So now I'm going to start, uh, I'm gonna, I get to start, I'm going to spend my 3 times f of t, OK? I'm going to spend it in the following way. I'm going to mark this node and this node and this node. These are the first three steps in your path. Now, I can, now, this 3 times f of t is at least this, because this node has value f of t. And by the subset property, this, this node has value at most f of t, and this node has value at most f of t. Right? So, so, I, can, so I start the game like this. Okay. Now, uh, OK. And then the whole idea of the game is that you're going to reveal to me the next step in your path, and I'm going to have to uh, respond. And I'm going to have to say that sort of, uh, I, can, I can choose different rewards such that you know, this tree is greater than the next tree. So, okay, so let's, let's look at an example. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is, okay, so let's look at this example first of all, which is, which is, a, which is a simple one. Um, in this example, you came here, uh, what I'm going to observe is that since this is not a rightmost edge, this is not a right edge. So I don't, need to take, I don't need to get this. I don't need to take care of this. So in this case, my move will just be the following move. I'll just go like this. By the subset property, I can make this move. I mean, this node is less, cost less than this node. So I can make this move, right? And, and, I, and I, the re this move was easy. I didn't need to get anything because this was not a rightmost turn. OK? Right, because now I'm going to have a sequence of inequalities. This sort of, maybe I should do it this way. Uh, just for this one step. This 3 times this is at least this. And this is at least, let's draw the same, the same thing. So this, this step was easy. Okay. This was the step I did here. 
Okay, and, and again, okay, so we're, this is the easy case. If this, if this top edge of the, at, at all times, I'm going to have three colored nodes like this. If this top edge was not a right edge, then actually uh, I don't need to do anything, and, I'm, and I can just make this easy move. This move is easy because this, right, this, this node, the value of this is greater than or equal to the value of this. So this move we can make, okay? This was an easy case. Let's look at the, I still have to look skeptical, so let's look at the, let's look at the, everybody remembers the lessons. All right. Okay, so let's, this is not the hard case. The hard case is, is when we need to poop, right? Okay, so, uh, so the hard case is if the path looks like this, it's the last, so, we, okay, so there's, this is the rightmost turn. So our, our, current, our current state, again, we're somewhere in the tree. Our current state looks like this. We've, it's, we've marked this, we've marked this, and we've marked this, okay? So now our path, you're, you're, again, you're specifying the path to me, and I'm just making sure I can take care of anything. Now in this case, okay, so now you, you specify to me the next, the next, okay, you want to make this, you want to make this move. I have to make this move. The reward is always going to be on the path? Yeah, the, the, the reward's always going to be on the path, and I'm going to, every time that I'm about to leave the last rightmost edge in the sequence, I'm going to have to get credit for it. I'm going to have to mark that edge as well, so that eventually I end up in this situation where all the last rightmost edges are marked, okay? In this step, this was not a rightmost edge, so I didn't care about marking it. I just kept sliding, I just kept like... Yeah, 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 but no, no, but I, but I need to get credit. Now, I need to, I need to, I need to move the snake so that the head, that the head is here, and, and I, but I need to, this is the pooping part. Yeah, I need to get the, I need to get the value of this edge, okay? No, the, 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 every, every subset of vertices and edges has a reward, has just the sum of the values, okay? Uh, so far, in this picture, you didn't see any edges getting a reward. Now, I'm going to, at the end of the proof, I don't care about the vertices anymore. I just care about the edges that I marked. But, I, but these vertices are going to help me pay for edges. So I, I initially invest three times f of t in three vertices. And now, as these vertices slide down the tree, they're going to help me pay for edges. So here is the important, here's, here's the, I mean, this is, this is really the heart of the matter. Uh, basically, you can assume that all the rightmost, all the last rightmost turns have been paid for inductively. And now, the snake is about to slither past this rightmost turn. We need to pay for it. That's the pooping part, because it, it's the end of the snake. Okay, look, I mean, it seems, still seems like the best analogy. If you don't like it, come up with a better analogy. But here's the, okay. So we need, we need to slide the snake down and also mark this edge, but still have it, still have it that the, the next configuration is at most the cost of this configuration. So how do we do it? Well, it's just the sum of the, of the values of all the marked edges and vertices. Yeah, that's the value of the configuration. Right? We're moving from our initial configuration here to this configuration always decreasing the value, so at the end we know that 3 times f of t is at least this. So each configuration is a sum of two edges and three vertices? No, no, it will be a sum of three vertices and all the edges that we've encountered that are rightmost, last rightmost, rightmost edges. Okay. No, I mean, the questions are great because I, it's a not, I mean, <laughs> it's still a, I mean, it's a, uh, but, but, but see, okay, yeah, again, if in this case nothing interesting is going on. We can just keep slithering because we don't need to mark anything. This is where all the action is going to happen. We need to pay for this last rightmost edge. So f the, f the first case I want to do, because it contains all the ideas, is the case when, is when the next place you want to go is not a rightmost edge. Okay? You want to go here. Okay? So, let's, so let's, say, let's look at the values of these nodes. This one is delta. This has diameter delta. This was a rightmost edge, so it stayed at delta. This was not a rightmost edge, so it went to delta over r. And this is not a rightmost edge, so it went to delta over r squared. Okay? So, okay, so let's see what happens. So first of all, um, now I want to apply my inequality here on, on, uh, on these balls. So, so what do I get? I want to apply the inequality. So from the inequality, first of all, I get this term, which if you, if you see, I get C, this term is C times alpha times square root log M. Square root log M is 2 to the n over 2. Okay? So I get this much. So in fact, I'm going to... Delta or something. What's that? Alpha and delta or something. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is... Yeah, I should put delta. Al, I mean, del, alpha equals delta in this instantiation. 
Uh, okay. So, so I know that the value of this set is at least, basically, I can, I, can, I can mark this edge and get rid of this. And I also get, what do I also get? I also get the minimum of B T i delta over R. Uh, OK, delta over R squared. It's the minimum of del delta f, of, I guess. OK. Uh, so you have to say, why is it delta over r squared? Because the separation between these points, if I'm at delta, the separation between these points is delta over r. OK. So that's why. So, uh, so, so this alpha over r is delta over r squared. OK. So I, I get this edge value, plus I get this. Now the whole idea is that I want to use, I want to use this to pay for this. If I can prove that this value is at least this value, then I can put the next thing here. And now I, and I have marked this edge, and I can keep going. So now why is it the case? So the first thing to observe is that the minimum here actually applies to this vertex T sub m. Because the, the order in which we chose these vertices was in terms of these balls being decreasing. So this little, this small ball has more weight than this small ball, has more weight than this small ball, has weight more weight than this small ball. So, so this minimum actually just applies is just is actually b t m delta over r squared f of f of that yes okay all right okay so that's the first thing but this t sub m was chosen so that among all the pieces in this set here it had the maximum delta over r squared value since this node where where is the where is the, oh yeah since this node is, is contained in a ball of radius delta of r squared, this value, this f value is bigger than this f value. Because this t sub m was chosen so that its delta of r squared ball was the maximum of everything in this set. So that means that, that means that this value, f of this, is at least, is at least the, the value here. In fact, it's at least the value of anything of delta r squared coming under this tree, also any of the other ones. Oh, yeah? So that's how, you move the, that's how you move the token and pay for the, I mean, the snake moved on and left something behind. Uh, that's how you pay for this right turn. Okay? And then there's only one more case, which is I said, uh, you know, the, the other case is what if this is the right turn? So that's not any conceptually, any more conceptually difficult. Let's just do the picture now. It's, it's exactly the same thing. Now the picture is, okay, we had a right turn like this. Uh, then there's a non-right turn, because we only need to pay for this if it's the last right turn. But then you chose to go down a right turn the next time instead of not a right turn. Okay? So now I'll let you keep going. And I'll just tell me when you stop making right turns. Okay? So you keep making right turns for a long time. Okay, eventually you stop. Good. Uh, so now the idea is I do the same thing. So, so we started in this configuration. Okay? Again, as before, I use this. To pay, for, to pay for this, plus I get a little bit extra, which is, which is this value. And now just observe that, I mean, how do the delta values go? This was delta. This is delta. This one is delta over r. Now, now it stays delta over r for a long time until finally we make a non-right turn, and this one is delta over r squared. But now the same argument applies. This delta over r squared ball must be bigger in value than this delta over r squared ball. So again, we can just move this down to, down to here. And of course, we need to get the things. But, but now these can be moved for just in the, in the trivial way we did before. You can always move these things down the tree to be here and here, because moving down the tree only decreases value. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was constipated. So, yeah. so, uh, so if things, I see. So if. It actually ends before you make the right turn. Then I guess there's nothing to pay. So, so, so you're saying you're saying what if we what if the, eventually we just stop at the last right turn? Okay. So the last it's true that the last the last right turn doesn't. We can always use one of these tokens to pay for the last right turn. I mean, if this if this was I mean, we just need to pay for this thing. How do we pay for it? Well, just move it here, and then I mean, then you just pay for it automatically. So you can always pay for the last right turn. Uh, Okay, so I'll draw the little box. But, 
But that's the end of the proof, that, uh, that the functional is at least the value of this partition. Okay? And, the, and again, let's see. So we're going to finish in an hour. That's good. Uh, so, so we can try to, now that we've seen it, we can try to figure out why, you know, the, the whole idea was this. We, we started with a space, uh, some diameter delta, and then we partitioned it into pieces of, of diameter delta over r. Okay? You know, a bunch of these pieces, diameter delta over r. All right. Um, now, okay, so, so this, of course, this partitioning gave us an upper bound at this level. But the lower bound has a deficit, right? The lower bound has this deficit that the, uh, it, ha it loses this factor of r. So the, the balls that we get in our lower bound here, we don't get these giant, we, we would love the lower bound was sort of like all these giant things, but the balls we get from the lower bound only look like this. Now this is a really crappy state to be in if, all the interest, if there was a like ton of interesting stuff going in here, because the lower bound would completely miss it. Like we could, we could lose all the space not containing these blue dotted balls if we just apply the lower bound to this. So we have to hope that someone was paying more attention at a higher scale, so that if we miss, if we miss something in here, somebody would have caught it beforehand. But we, how, how are we going to ensure that happens? We do this by look. We had, I mean, if we want somebody at a higher scale to be paying attention, then we should be paying attention to what's going at lower scales, right? So that's, so that's somehow this, what this delta over r squared versus delta over r thing is doing. You optimize so that you make sure you're taking care of the lower scales. But of course, you have to partition. I mean, uh, uh, where, was that? Uh, where was this, this used in the proof? This was this, this, was this the, the masterful step of you know, the proof when we managed to take this to pay for this next thing down here. Right? This thing only gives, us, only gives us minimums, but we got a maximum, right? We said that, that, this, that this value was greater than anything that came down here, not just the minimum. So somehow this, this was because sort of when we chose this vertex, we were looking ahead to make sure, you know, at this step, sort of, there could have been a lot of loss, but we made sure that we covered it at the next step. It's exactly taking care of this situation. That, you know, there could be lots of stuff. The lower bound at this step is only going to see what's inside the green ball. So there's a lot, I mean, the blue ball. So there's a lot of stuff that it's missing. We need to hope that if we're missing stuff there, then somebody at an earlier level who could sort of had a better viewpoint of what's going on in the space was, was taking care of it. And to do that, I mean, yeah, as I said, sort of we make sure that we're taking care of the next scale. So, yeah, it's kind of a pretty beautiful proof of uh, Michelle. <laughs> When is the movie coming out? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andre. Can it be applied yeah. to any other, to other functional besides from the supremum? <sighs> okay, so um, let me say two two things. Oh, aside from the supremum, uh, somehow in this field, the supremum is the most interesting thing many people study. But it has been applied to non-Gaussian processes, like p-stable processes, or in general, sort of any kind of process where you have some kind of exponential tail with some power. You can do something similar, although, although instead of having one distance, a lot of times you get a family of distances that comes up. So let me just say, I told Jeff I would say something about this. So let me just say why uh, my selfish motivation for, for understanding this proof. Because uh, uh, this proof has the, has the weird property that maybe the more natural thing to do is, is why do you stop at a bound number of pieces? Just keep cutting out delta over r balls. And so you exhaust the space. And then the next step, cut out delta over r squared balls and keep going like this. Uh, OK, so that's how the original proof was done. But uh, this proof has some nice features that, uh, I mean, that come up in, in analyzing. Let me just say this problem that, that Telegram worked on for quite a long time, uh, which is the, the Bernoulli conjecture. So uh, as we said in the first talk, Okay, and I'll stop in, in five minutes. So, uh, as we said in the first talk, we can consider a Gaussian process in a different way. Just take t to be a subset of L2, so it's a subset of the sequences where the sum of the squares is, is, is bounded. Um, and then define your process in the following way. Okay. Also take an infinite family of, so these are iid normal zero ones. Uh, and then your process is just, uh, just this, okay? 
So for a, for a separable Gaussian process, this is a generic construction. This gets you anything you want. So and the index right here is t. So the question is, what if you consider instead of, uh, instead of Gaussians here, uh, something very natural, which would be the, the Bernoulli process, where these things are just ID, you know, uniform plus minus one random variables. Okay? And instead of, so instead of trying to, thinking about controlling the expected soup for these Gaussians, what if you tried to control the expected soup of these random sums of signs? Okay. So, um, so, okay, so there are, there are two uh, observations that come up there. So, I mean, how did we start the Gaussian setting? We started, we, we came up with a natural upper bound, or which is this chaining, and then we tried to match it. So what's the natural upper bound for the Bernoulli process? Well, one natural upper bound is that, I mean, and I guess I'll leave this as an, this as an exercise, that for some universal constant, which is at most um, five, I mean, I think it's square root pi over two, but I have to think about it for a second. One thing you can do just by a convexity argument is observe that the expected remainder for the Bernoullis is always bounded by some constant times the same thing for the Gaussians. Okay? It makes sense. The Gaussians have tails and the Bernoullis don't, so they tend to be bigger. Right? So this is one way of bounding the process. Okay, so in fact, if we, right, okay, so let's define, uh, if we define sort of b of t in the same way we define g of t, so b of t is the expected supremum of the sum of the epsilon i t i's, this says that, this is just says that b of t is at most a constant times g of t. That's one way of, upper, of, of getting control on the expected supremum. If we, the Bernoulli supremum is at most a constant times the Gaussian supremum. All right. Uh, but then there's another way of upper bounding a Bernoulli process that doesn't apply in the Gaussian setting, which is just this second way of upper bounding it, which is that this is at most the, the maximum L1 norm of any vector in the, in the set. Of course, the maximum value of this sum is if, is if all the signs of the epsilon i's coincide with the values of the ti's, and then you can upper bound it by the L1 norm. Right? This doesn't, I mean, so, you know, okay. So these are two ways to upper bound it. And then finally, there, you can combine these two ways together in the following sense. Uh, if you put t uh, inside a set t1 plus t2, so this t1 plus t2, this is the Minkowski sum. So it, this is the set of all a plus b such that a is in t1 and b is in t2. If you put t inside a set like this, then it's immediately clear that uh, Then you have this. In particular, you can mix the two kinds of bounds together. So you can, OK, so now up to a constant, you can write them like OK. So you can, you can mix the Gaussian and the, and the sort of the L, good, good, good name, and the L1, L1 upper bounds together uh, according to some decomposition like this. And Tallegren's conjecture, the Bernoulli conjecture, is that this is a uni universal way of upper bounding the process. So for every Bernoulli, pro for never every Bernoulli process, so for every t, uh, there exists t1 and t2 such that t is contained in t1 plus t2. And, uh, and in fact, the b of t value is precisely, I mean, of the constants given by what, what's going on in the, in the Gaussian setting for T1 plus the L1 bound for T2. What's the example that G of T is not a corresponding lower bound? Um, uh, take, take a family of, uh, I mean, take, a, take your set T to be E1, E2, E3, and so on. So now, in the Gaussian case, uh, the expected supremum is infinite. I mean, this is because it's, it's the supremum of of an infinite number of IID Gaussians, but in the Bernoulli case, of course, the supremum is one. I mean, you, if you sum up one term, you get, yeah. So, uh, so in fact, they can be arbitrarily different. And of course, I mean, of course, this describes the whole, the whole heart of the problem, which is that when I, take, when I take vectors t, which are very spread out, the Bernoulli sum, you know, by the central limit theorem, tends to behave just as does the Gaussian sum. But if I take things that are concentrated, then 
it, be, it sort of it behaves more like this bound, or it can behave more like this bound. And now the problem is that the process could be a mixture of these behaviors at all scales, going back and forth and being, you know. A different way of saying it is that this process is rotationally invariant. So if you rotate this set T, the distribution here doesn't change. Whereas, of course, I mean, this, this process is, is crazily aligned with the coordinates. It doesn't have this rotational invariance at all. Um, so anyway, when you consider, when you consider this process, it seems that the most natural thing to do is instead of considering one distance, you consider a family of distances. What's that family of distances? Um, uh, you sort of think about truncating these vectors t so they have bounded L infinity norm. Once, you, once, once these things have bounded L infinity norm, then you can start to use some kind of comparison with the Gaussian case. But now you sort of need to consider all the truncations. You know, you truncate. You know, you don't truncate. You look what happens when you when you when you sort of when I say truncate, I just mean like sort of cap out the coordinates, you know, like max, make the coordinates you know, have some maximum value by just cutting off the, the tops of them. Uh, and you can consider it sort of, it seems to understand this process, you have to consider what happens as this truncation parameter goes from infinity to zero. And you get this family of distances. And, and this setting where you index things by the number of points instead of the distance is much better when you have many different distances. Because then you're always making progress. You're getting more and more sets. As opposed to if you, have a, if you have a bunch of distances and you have different distances in every cluster, it's not clear, like, I mean, which is your diameter going down with respect to what distance or whatever. So anyway, this, is, this was my motivation for understanding Tyler Grant's uh, new way of proving this. OK, that's all. One more thing. Maybe you want to spend a minute on saying how, these, how the gamma 2, the Tyler Grant functional, serves to replace the login in the johnson trust theorem. Uh, there's the place to log in and then Johnson Linux. Uh, uh, okay, maybe. It's, I mean, we've already seen it. It's the, it's, it, it, you combine chaining with the tail bound that we, we already have, but. Uh, okay, let's just leave okay. that as a hint for anyone who wants to pursue it. And uh, let's thank James.